Welcome to this lecture on statistics for high throughput experiments. I'm Lucas Schell and I'm at the School of Biotechnology of KTH. As we move from the world of single readout experiments to high throughput experiments, uh, the notion about what quality metrics to report for the experimental readouts changes. Um, this has got to do with the numbers of observations that we make in each experiment. In a high, typical high throughput experiments we make uh, thousands or millions of readouts and um, settings, in this setting um, unlikely or rare events become quite likely and for instance a, what we call a once in a million experience, experience in, in, a, in a single readout experiment uh, actually becomes quite likely when we made say 10 millions of readouts in one single experiment. So um, we have to change the way we think about, um, about uh, probabilities in an experiment. Uh, but in order to be able to explain the proper way to report statistics in a high throughput experiment, I have to start off by, by telling you how we traditionally report statistics in single readout experiments. Um, so we will start with hypothesis testing and p-values. And once we define that, we could move over to false discovery rate calculations and, and um, uh, q-values and um, uh, eventually as well posterior error, posterior error probability calculations of high throughput experiments. But let's start with single readout experiments and the error sources that we subject ourselves for in, inside of um, single readout experiments. Uh, and first off, the sampling errors. Most experiments aim at describing a trait or a set of traits of a population. The way we do so is by picking a random sample out of the population. Um, and this sample will be the, the set of individuals that we do our experiments on and we, the ones that we measure this particular trait that we're interested in on. When we do so, we subject ourselves to sampling errors. Um, we might either have been selecting a too few number of, uh, of individuals to be describing the full population, or we might have been selecting uh, individuals uh, in a biased manner so that we select a certain kind of individuals more frequently than others. Um, this is unfortunately not the only kind of errors that we introduce when, when doing this kind of experiments. We know as well have to deal with measurement errors, um, uh, both in forms of systematic measurement errors due to the fact that we, uh, our measurement systems might not be calibrated enough, well calibrated enough, or uh, different types of uh, sampling, or, or sorry, noise, uh, random noise, is due to the fact that we, our measurement systems might not be accurate enough. We as well have this jargon that we use, we, we call the variation due, that we introduce due to the measurement systems uh, themselves, the, the technical variation, where there's the variation of the population and the, for that sake as well, for the what inside of the samples are called the biological variation. Frequently, one ends up in situations where one would like to compare uh, the status of two different populations. This be, would be typically be a case and control population and case and control studies, or it could as well be patient groups that have been treated and or untreated. Um, in any case, it's, it's a great tool to, to compare two different populations because we could cancel out eventually measurement errors by, uh, or at least the, the uh, measurement biases, because due to the fact that we're doing the same kind of measurements on, on both the healthy and the disease population. So I demonstrated here this scenario by, by um, a somewhat arbitrary uh, example here where, where we have defined a healthy population uh, and uh, as well as a disease population. Each of those populations have a certain feature that we're interested in studying. Um, we call it um, the mean of that feature my here for the, for the sake of the argument and uh, our interest here is to make an uh, inference procedure that could make us a uh, conclusion regarding to the difference in these, these mean features between the healthy and the disease population. 
So the way we do that so is that we select a random sample from each of those two population um, and then we measure on those uh, samples uh, on the sample um, we, we measure the particular trait we're interested in why and um, we as well calculate the mean of that trait uh, y bar and um, we compare those means between the, the healthy sample and the disease sample and now uh, we will find a difference between those sample means and now the question is is this difference in sampling uh, and the sample means due to just random noise or is it actually uh, a true underlying uh, difference uh, between the between the population means and so is there um, is this difference just explainable by, by random events is this, this is just what we expected to happen or is this something more fundamental a very common fundament for making a statistical model between that will be able to make inferences regarding the, the uh, difference between two different populations is so called hypothesis testing. Um, here we make two different hypotheses, uh, two different competing hypotheses. First of all, the null hypothesis, that is that there's no difference between um, the population means, or um, the alternative hypothesis, the situation where there actually is a difference between the population means. Uh, typically we're interested in the alternative hypothesis more, more so than the null hypothesis. We, we typically want to detect a difference between um, the two populations, but we still put up this null hypothesis in order to make a better statistical model. It's actually um, quite hard to know the actual underlying difference between the two populations and it's much easier to prove um, uh, you make inferences from the null hypothesis and the way we do this is that we, we assume that the null model is or the null hypothesis is correct and we then um, try to um, assess the probability that we observe a situation as extreme as the one that we observed in our samples and if this become this probability become low enough we're able to react in the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis the far most common way to do so is using so-called p-values or p-value thresholds and a p-value is the probability that the result was obtained that was at least as extreme or more extreme as the one that we observed um, under the null hypothesis so actually we assume that there's no difference between the underlying uh, populations and then see how likely it is that we obtain two samples that are as different as the ones that we observed um, or more different. Um, a typical procedure is that we compare the obtained p-value with a preset p-value threshold, typically 5% or 1%. So if the obtained p-value is lower than this threshold, we react in all hypothesis. That is to say that we, we believe there is a real effect in this experiment. One interesting feature that we will not will be using quite a lot um, further on in the, this uh, lecture is that p-values they are uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis. So it's, as equ it's equally um, probable to observe a p-value of 0.01 as uh, 0.99. If there is a reason to believe that there's the uh, errors or the differences between the two samples um, is normally distributed, there's a very easy test for, for assessing p-values from, from measurements. And that's called the student's t-test. Um, it's by far more most commonly used um, test for, for calculating p-values. So, um, the t-test it uses a, a test statistic known as the t and uh, it looks at, at the difference between the sample means and it compares that or calculates the fraction between that and the stereo, standard error of the difference of the means. Um, and this, um, if you inject this into, into uh, 
uh, a t-test calculator, it will return um, a p-value to you. A larger t, t uh, normally is associated with a lower p-value. So the larger your t-r, the more significant your, your test is. Um, it's worth noting that uh, the standard error is something that uh, the st standard error of the difference of the means. It's a decreasing function with the sample size. So given that you have a uh, if you want to have more power in your test or um, if you believe that there's an underlying difference that is bigger uh, or that exists then the if you increase the sample size you get a larger t which gives you more significance as well so your test becomes more sensitive if you increase the sample size and this is a common theme uh, for all all tests actually so uh, you get obtain statistical power by increasing the number of samples So um, the, student tends, the student's t-test assumes uh, that the, the differences between the uh, features of the, the, uh, the, the or the differences between the, between the sample means is normally distributed. And uh, there are uh, variants of the student's t-test that are including a test that uh, harbor unequal sample sizes and unequal population variance and paired samples as well. Um, there's easy tests out to you, both online and, and inside of, for instance, in Excel. They're, it's sort of, they're pretty easy to use and hence become sort of a standard for, for, for uh, testing. There is as well a ex nice expansion of the uh, t-test into an, an ANOVA or the analysis of variance. Um, an ANOVA test uh, can take more than, than two um, populations in account or, or to expand it to three or more, more more variables as well or three or more populations as well. It can as well take uh, dependent variables in account or a time dependent variable for instance. Uh, so it's a little bit more flexible than the t-test itself. Um, just as the um, uh, t-test it compares the variance um, within the sample group with the variance between the sample groups and if the variance between the sample groups is found significantly larger than this variance put in the sample groups um, we we find uh, a ground to, to uh, conclude that we can react the null hypothesis um, there are of course a slew of different other tests that you can do in order to calculate p-values I will not have time to cover them here. We will come back a little bit later on how we can do um, uh, non-parametric p-value calculations further on or later on in the presentation. So um, let's just turn back now to the, the random or the statistical inference procedure that we outlined before. Um, we have two populations between healthy and disease populations and we want to make an inference regarding uh, one particular trait in this, this, um, uh, pop these two populations. And the way we do this is by withdrawing sample from each of the populations and measuring this, this particular trait that we're interested in on the different um, samples. Um, okay, so what if, if we, it's more than one single trait that we want to, to study? What if there's a set of n different traits that are occurring here, and uh, um, would this make any difference to our procedure? Um, we actually say that the the where uh, those n treats um, we actually would like to make n different inferences because uh, each of those traits might or might not be different between the healthy and the diseased individuals. Uh, so we end up in a situation that where we make multiple tests. Would this make a difference at all? The answer is yes. It actually makes a big difference if we just are comparing one thing at a time or many things at a time. Um, and this is what we call the multiple hypothesis co correction uh, that we have to make. Okay, but before we make um, any further assumptions about multiple hypothesis correction, let's let's look at the motivating example. So this example I found a couple of years ago in Nature. 
was a um, pretty extensive study where one of the parts involved a microarray study um, of two different mice populations. Um, they had compared the transcription level between um, uh, as large probe sets of, uh, of um, genes and they found that a pretty large number of probes were found um, differentially expressed. So, so they had measured a, quite a number of uh, differentially expressed uh, genes. Um, they, uh, for different p-value thresholds, uh, they, they found different uh, number of, of differentially expressed uh, genes. And for, for instance, a, a p-value of 0.05, 2,500. Uh, that sounds pretty impressive, right? 2,500 different differentially expressed genes. That's uh, this surely is a difference between those two populations, right? No, it's actually not true, uh, and. The reason why is that, uh, well, if we just start to calculate how many probes would we expect to be significant on a null hypothesis, assume that there are 50,000 probes or, or on this microarray, uh, uh, then uh, that is that we do 50,000 comparisons. How many of those probes would we expect to be significant on a null hypothesis? Um, remember now that the p values, as we said before, are uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis. That means that all p values are as, e, as, um, as uh, probable to observe. Under such conditions, um, it's just to multiply the p value threshold to find uh, the number of p values that we expect to go above a certain p value threshold. So for a p value threshold of one per milli, you fi will find 50 probes that are differentially expressed. and uh, Actually, if you use a p-value threshold of 0 0.05, you'll find 2,500 p-values that are differentially expressed. Now, if you compare that to the 2,492, you actually find less differentially expressed genes than, than you would expect, um, just by chance. Um, so, uh, this is obviously something that's been flawed in this, this study. Uh, now, I must um, emphasize that the, the author of this study had made plenty of other um, uh, evidence to back up their, their findings on, on in other experiments, but I wouldn't trust this uh, experiment at all, this part of the experiment at all. Okay, um, so how do we uh, compensate for the fact that we are making multiple hypotheses? So measures like the p-value, they account for situations where we conduct one hypothesis test. So what about situation where we have multiple different types of um, hypotheses that we want to correct for. So how do we actually account for, for situations where we um, are testing for multiple hypotheses at the same time? The probably most easy and straightforward way to uh, conduct multiple hypothesis corrections are so-called uh, Bonferroni corrections. Um, here we are looking for thresholds that allow us to control for the family-wise error rate. That is um, the uh, threshold that we are looking for for scenarios where we make at most or one or more uh, false positives. Um, so we presumably want to set this threshold in such a manner so that we control all the individual probes so to guarantee that there's not one uh, single uh, false positive among them. So um, this is actually quite easily to obtain since we know that the null uh, or, or the, the p-values are uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis. So if we just divide our anticipated family-wise error rate, uh, say 5%, with the number of probes that we are looking or examining, um, say that we are um, looking for 50,000 different features and then we just divide our family-wise error rate with the number of features, and voila, we get a stringent, uh, more stringent p-value threshold uh, that is one through to, one through ten to minus six, um, uh, which is a very strict p-value threshold. Um, but if we are all our null hypotheses are below this threshold, we can guarantee a family-wise error rate of less than five percent. This is seen as very conservative, as um, we normally want to allow there to be more than one false positive. Uh, it's 
is normally seen as a far too stringent uh, threshold to use a family wise error rate. Um, hence, we are looking for other types of corrections, multiple hypothesis corrections. There's actually a better way to calculate or to make multiple hypothesis corrections, and that's to control for false scale rates instead of p values. Um, and I will use the next couple of slides to describe the false scale rate. So, first of all, what is a false scale rate? Um, so, um, here we have sketched on a scenario where, where this applies. We have conducted a large set of um, tests uh, or um, sets of tests and calculates a set of um, p values or maybe scores. Uh, just for simplicity of the example here, I, I'll allow, allow the uh, scores to be sorted like, like p-values. So we have set the, the most um, high scoring alternative, or rather the, the one with the lowest p-value on top of this list. And then the, uh, all the different tests come in, in the order of the, their um, p-value. So in, in, um, Letting uh, the increase in p-value that is with lower probability of being correct, uh, and it is uh, somewhat unrealistic scenario. Somebody has actually told us which are the um, which of the statistics adhere to the alternative hypothesis and which ones adhere to the null hypothesis. This is of course not very realistic as a scenario. We're normally um, preoccupied with scenarios where where we don't uh, know which of the tests that are adhering to the alternative, which one are, are to null hypothesis. We are just um, uh, designing, trying to design a threshold here that allows us to, to in some way control for, for the number of null hypothesis above this threshold. For, for this particular threshold, we, we record that there are two of the, out of ten of the hypotheses that are generated under null hypothesis. Um, now the full square rate would be the expected fraction of um, tests uh, that are below the threshold of x that are generated under null hypothesis. So if we would repeat this experiment over and over again and found that, that 2 out of 10 in, in average are above this threshold, we would conclude that the false scale rate of this particular threshold is 20%. So far it's quite easy, but uh, remember now that nobody has told us actually w which hypothesis that are, we are going to test are going to be generated under alternative hypothesis and which are to be generated under null hypothesis. So that's for us to assess and how could we do this all? Well, one of the keys are to assume a mixture model here. Uh, we assume a mixture model be between the hypothesis that we're using. So uh, we recognize that some of the hypotheses are, are are, uh, some of the features are generated under the alternative hypothesis and some are generated on null hypothesis. So um, when we observe the probability of a certain threshold that would be um, actually um, composed of, of two different uh, probabilities with the, both the probability of, of being um, from, from the, the null distribution or prior probability of being from the null distribution and the particular probability of, of um, uh, this feature under the null hypothesis, uh, plus the probability of actually being from, from the, the prime probability of coming from, from the uh, alternative hypothesis and the probability of, of observing an, a value as high as, p, uh, as the current p-value uh, under this alternative hypothesis. So I just want like to think about this exercise here a little bit for, for a second. So we have different distributions of p-values here. So uh, which of the following histograms of p-values would you uh, would be exp would be a likely outcome of a well calibrated high throughput experiment? Would it be the scenario A here, where um, we got um, a decreasing number of um, alternative hypotheses for, for that are decreasing with higher p-value, or would it be, or that's actually a scenario for both A, B, and C here? But whereas the null model, null, uh, null statistics, or rather the the uh, p-value stemming from, from the null model, would be uniformly distributed in A. It will be increasing for higher p-values in B and C. Um, and whereas and as well, there will be exponential increasing in, in the scenario of C rather than linear increasing as in B.
So which one of those three scenarios do you think is the, the most likely outcome of a well-calibrated high throughput experiment? The answer is A here. Um, and here we have made use of the fact that p-values are uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis. So any value between 0 and 1 will be as equally probable to observe and hence we obtain, we are likely to obtain a distribution just like the one in A here. So for any given part, um, part of this um, probability histogram, um, we are seeing a mixture between alternative hypothesis and, and, and uh, null hypothesis. This so in the following couple of slides we will use this property um, the even distribution of the p-values to um, calculate the full discovery rate as a given p-value threshold. To show you how to do that I will follow the uh, nomenclature used in Story and Tipshirani in their 2003 paper in PNAS. Um, I highly recommend you to read the paper itself and have it side by side here of my presentation um, as it contains more details about the actual cal calculations. But I so see this just as an introduction to how the calculations should be read. Um, so um, just a couple of notes of the nomenclature here. Um, the setting is that we have a p-value threshold, t, that um, uh, all the true nulls above this um, uh, threshold are, are, are called f, uh, there's a function f, and the, the above the same threshold the alternative to, uh, hypothesis above the same threshold are t, and f plus t is equal to s, the number of, uh, the total number of, of um, uh, p-values above the same threshold. And um, if we look on the total number of uh, p-values in, in our whole experiments, they will be equal to m, where of M0 stems from the true null uh, or the true null hypothesis and M1 from the alternative uh, hypothesis. Um, not shown here on the slide are as well two um, prior probabilities. Uh, the prior probability pi0 uh, standing for the probability, prior probability of uh, confirming to the null hypothesis and pi1 which is the probability of the be belonging to the alternative hypothesis. Um, so we want to calculate the false discovery rate, the, that's the expected value of um, the fraction of null p-values above the threshold, score threshold. And um, uh, so that's the expected value of f divided by s. Um, and this in fact is not a new idea in itself, uh, it stems from Benjamin and Hochberg, but here they as well have introduced a couple of new things to this uh, false discovery rate calculation that pays off a bit to the end. Um, and um, so once again we got m different p-values, uh, say that we have ordered them from the, the smallest to the largest one and <coughs> for any threshold now we can say that uh, um, you, you can of course calculate the number of um, uh, p-values above this, this threshold. That's just to observe the, and count the p-values. Um, while the false discovery rate now is the, the fraction between now the, the number of null p-values of that um, uh, divided by the total number, we can see that for evenly the evenly distributed p-values we um, can of course, the or the even the distributed p-values under the null hypothesis. That is, uh, we can calculate f of t as the uh, number of null p-values in total times the the um, uh, the, the score threshold itself, just as we did when when before um, when we calculated the number of expected p-values above a score threshold for for uh, the microarray experiment. So that's so f of t that will be well estimated by m zero times t, uh, which as well equals to this prior probability pi zero 
uh, times m times t. So that's uh, calculating false scale rate, or, or uh, at least an estimate of the false scale rate uh, based on, on the observed p value distribution, would just now be equal to the, the, an estimate of the pi zero uh, times m, the number of, of the total number of p values times the score threshold. Uh, and divide that by the number of p-values that we observed above the same threshold, which is an easy task to, to calculate. So, uh, we, prob we have to come back to how exactly to calculate this factor pi zero later on in our slides, but the m is known, that's simply the number of um, uh, statistics that we are looking at, the number of p-values that we have been taken in account, and uh, t is just this, the p-value threshold itself, and we can of course count the number of p-values above the same threshold. So just a graphical illustration of the same phenomena. So our estimate here of, false scale rate, uh, of the false scale rate will be now just the area, uh, the, the the number of null hypotheses divided by the number of uh, the total number of uh, hypotheses about it, this score threshold. So uh, th this will be the red area uh, divided by the green plus the red area. Um, and this is um, the and the red area here is just calculated through the fact that the the null p-values are evenly distributed all over our run, or all over the, the 0 to 1 area. Okay, so how do we calculate pi-0? Well, um, the prior probability pi-0 would be technically equal to now the number of, um, or it would be very, very well estimated by, by uh, if we could in some way calculated the, the area of the under the curve here of the red uh, distribution or um, and just divide that by by the total number of hypotheses in total um, this is a little bit harder to do than it looks like so inside of the uh, uh, story to Shirani paper they instead look on a, they twist the problem a little bit and they say that they'll they take more interest in, in uh, calculating the number of p-value above a uh, score threshold at this time. So they, they check the number of p-values above the threshold and um, they compare that to, to the uh, total number of um, uh, p-values uh, times 1 minus this p-value threshold. So this would be taking this um, blue area the, above the, the score threshold and divide that by, by the total number, that is the, the blue plus the yellow area here, and times itself the p-value p threshold minus one, or mi one minus this p-value threshold. Um, this, why, why, why do you do this? Well, actually, of course we want to, to estimate this for, for as a high p-value threshold as possible, the closer, um, to one, we select lambda here for estimate. Uh, the uh, the more close we will be, in theory, to to the uh, the pi zero. However, um, the closer we get to one as well, the more subject we are to variation of of the p values. So there's a trade off. Uh, there's an optimal trade off here between being having a high p value, uh, being more accurate, and sort of taking the variation of the p values in account. Um, and the way they solve this in an article, at least at a couple of times, is that they, they calculate pi zero estimates for, for all different, uh, for a whole set of different uh, lambdas. And then they fit uh, a third degree polynomial to, to this, uh, this distribution and see where that third degree polynomial hits the, uh, the lambda equal to 1 and make that as the pi zero estimate for, for subsequent uh, uh, calculations. Story and Tipshirani also go on to define uh, what we call a Q value. 
and this is a relevant measure uh, to individual indications. And so he made to ensure that we had got a monotonically increasing function with a p-value threshold. So the, the q-value is defined as the minimum forces scale rate, including the current uh, p-value threshold. Um, I'll, next couple of slides, that I'll show you a motivated example. So here is a demonstration of what, why a Q value is important for us. Uh, just to show this, I will tell you or demonstrate what happens if you descend through a list using a full normal false discovery rate. So in this case, we have a score um, uh, indicative of the correctness of the, of the um, uh, statistic that we were reflecting. Uh, so we, we sorted the um, uh, statistics according to their score in descending order here, uh, but the higher score being more likely to be correct. And some, just as before here, we have um, a little bit non-typical, um, uh, be given the, the labels of, of the examples. So we, the green ones are adhering to the, the, the alternative model and uh, uh, the red um, statistics here are uh, indicative of, of um, the, the statistic adhering to, to the null model or being generated to, through the null model. So uh, for now when as we descend through this list of uh, statistics and we set the uh, increasing lower threshold we will from the start have a false scale rate for on the level of 7.5 we will have a um, full scale rate of zero. And we will have a zero all, all the way until we reach our first incorrect uh, statistic at 6.7. And we'll then see a sharp raise in the, the full scale rate. We will see a full scale rate of 20%. Um, however, as we lower the threshold again, the full scale rate will drop due to the fact that we include more correct PSM. So uh, we begin with 1 out of 6 being incorrect, 1 out of 7, 1 out of 8 being incorrect. And not until we reach 6.3 6 again, we see a jolt up to a higher false cover rate than we had uh, at 6.7. This means that if we see, look on the plot here down below, where we have plotted a number of accepted PSMs, as a function of false cover rate, is that we see a spiky appearance of the false cover rate. We, we see a higher false cover rate for a lower number of PSMs than for, for a higher number of PSMs. This is non-optimal when we want to set the threshold um, uh, on based, based on um, uh, the statistic, because it's not really clear what the false cover rate threshold of 1.8 would really mean. Would it include Five would it include uh, eight, or would it include uh, nine PSMs? So, or nine statistics. So uh, that's why we instead look at the this entity Q, Q value, um, where we look on the minimal false scale rate instead. And here um, we can see that when we do this calculation now for for or this uh, minimization for each threshold, uh, we always tend, we, we will always find the lower bound here of, of the, so, so the Q value here plotted in green on top of the previous false scale rate in blue, uh, will sort of smoothen out those two peaks. And at this point, it will become clear what the false scale rate threshold will really mean, or rather a Q value threshold will mean. So if we set the, a particular Q value threshold, there will be a particular number or accept the PSMs or we would um, uh, know how to translate a uh, false scale rate into score as well. There's no ambiguity anymore. So lastly I would like to introduce you to yet another concept and that's the posterior error probability or um, this is also known sometimes as local FDR and this uh, the posterior error probability is the probability that a particular identification with a certain score uh, is incorrect. Um, so that will be the case or, or, or 
or generated under the null hypothesis that is. So this is an analog with, with the, the QL itself or the uh, false cover rate itself. Remember before when we were defining the false cover rate we were um, comparing the, this green area here above the threshold. Uh, in the graph below here we, we used the red area of the, eight, the null hypothesis and related that to, to the sum, the area of the green and the red area. Um, that would, would was our false cover rate. The, the local false cover rate is, is just for the particular threshold, so it would be the, the right hand border of those areas. Um, uh, so uh, we will then compare the difference in height between, between the red areas, right border here, with the, uh, the total length of, of, of the red plus the green area. Um, and this will be our positive error probability. The, this is a bit cumbersome to, to derive in practical terms because um, the p-value distribution will always be a little bit jaggered by the, by, by the actual, in, in actual observed set of, of, of observabilities due to the random effects that occur. So, so any posterior error probability estimator will have to include some smoothness process where you have to, to use a lowest filter or, or, a, uh, or a spline fit or any kind of operation that will um, smoothen our observations to obtain um, an even distribution of, of samples uh, in order to derive the posterior error probability. So it's always be, be uh, somewhat tricky. Then we can rely on different types of softwares to do this for us. Um, so why do we need these different issues? Well, just to drive this home again. Well, false discoveries in Q-values, there are, are good when we will identify sets of significant readouts. So they're typically um, interesting when, when you have um, your, a set of, of, of identifications that we want to identify. Uh, this could be our, when our um, downstream analysis involves, so, say for instance, um, enrichment analysis or some or pathway enrichment analysis or something where, where we are interested in actually identify sets of, of identifications. However, if we take interest in a particular readout from a, from a high throughput experiment, it might be more valuable actually to to investigate the posterior error probability because that would be more um, directly focusing on the property of, the, of this particular readout. So if you just want to make one readout from, from a high throughput experiment, check the posterior error probability of that readout. And a PNE value from the experiment, that should be solely reserved for, for experiments where you render one single readout. Um, this is very seldom the case for, for high throughput biology, so I would advise you to never use a P or E report P or E values for, for any high throughput experiment. This concludes my presentation for today. So um, thank you for your attention.